Hello and welcome back to the Guns on Pegs podcast. My name is George Brown and I'm the editor at Guns on Pegs. As usual, I'm joined by Chris Horn, managing director of Guns on Pegs. Chris, shortly after this goes out, you will be enjoying your first day of the season. Are you excited? <laughs> Absolutely, George. Uh, so, so Barney Stratton, who obviously was on our last episode, um, he's gone and set the bar really high for future podcast guests <laughs> uh, by inviting us both on a day shooting. <laughs> Um, so um, yeah, incredibly generous. Uh, and um, George, you can't make it though, can you? No, sadly, I'm actually moving house that weekend, which is poor timing. Um, but in the long run, it will mean that I have easier access to ad hoc shooting. I won't be in London. I'll be back down in Hampshire where I grew up. Easy access to the farm. So if I fancy going and shooting some pigeons, I can just go and do that rather than it being months in the planning. Uh, so that's yeah, t- really dis- that's a tout for invites, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you're in Hampshire, uh, have gone, we'll travel. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it would have been lovely, and I got very excited talking about partridge shooting. So I'm very disappointed not to be going. I was thinking that because so so with my first day at Stockton in a few days' time. Um, doesn't it just make a shoot day a lot more exciting if you like record a podcast prior to it, spend the whole time discussing that day and the build up? Yeah, all right, rub it in, I mean, rub it in. It's, I don't mind. <laughs> I've, I've never had a shoot day where we sort of analysed it on air for a couple of hours and then just sort of gone and done it. You know, that's it's totally different. No, but it was a really fun, fun episode, and I'm sure that you will have a very nice time. And as I said in my uh, email to Barney saying that I couldn't come, I'm sure that the the ratio for the day will be. Uh, immeasurably improved by my absence so um, (laughs) but um chris i think uh we better move things on um do you want to introduce our guest indeed so um i think it's really important to give some background to this episode because um george you and i had a chat a while ago about shoot lodges we were just sort of thinking about various things that get us going and that's where this pod idea came from um and we agreed at the time that an ultimate shoot lodge would be a sort of timber frame building. We were getting quite rustic. We were chatting about it. So what we did was we set out to find about who would be best to chat to about the ultimate shoot lodge. And it just so happens that the owner of Oak Rights, which is an oak frame building company, Tim Crump, is a member of Guns on Peg. So here we are. <laughs> so Tim um, started out as a carpenter. Uh, and has gone on to develop a very successful business, Oak Rights, um, that he started with a friend in 1999. And that probably makes him the most qualified man you could find to discuss this topic with us. Uh, so a huge warm welcome to Tim Crump. Hi, Chris. It's uh, good to good to catch up. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me. It's uh, be a fun subject, something very close to my heart. I love shooting. I've, I've shot all my life. Started off with my father, through to friends, wandering around with a little 410. Uh, bolt action wow. ones back in the day and one with a with a with a hammer on it so stiff that I could hardly pull the hammer back <laughs> um, going on to become a carpenter building oak frame buildings and we have built many beautiful structures which could be shooting lodges and we have built um, one building that was was became a shooting lodge so yes so, great great fun to so be you here. ready to get carried away with our discussion about what an ultimate shoot lodge looks like <laughs> oh boy oh boy um you know yes we with with the oak frame i always think an oak framed barn is like the rural cathedral really when you're in a barn you can see why oak frame barns are used for wedding venues because they feel like a, a cathedral in a way and also, if you're building a shoot lodge, you want that open, airy space. If it could be on a nice hillside overlooking a valley or a glen, and uh, you know when the mist comes down, you're sat there with a roaring fire going, great big glazed gable. Uh. You know, you're, you're in the warm, the, the the rain and the wind are howling in up in Mid Wales, Scotland, or somewhere like that. You you know you, you're set up for the afternoon. Then who needs the shooting? You just enjoy the afternoon. <laughs> Talk about it. Have a chat and make up a story. <laughs> well, it's so true. And and because this is the Guns on Pegs podcast, we can decide the weather and the location and everything else. You know, it's just it's just done, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I think, well, if we're going to decide the weather, we probably need it to be, you know, 
cold and, and sharp throughout the day, but then starting to a sleet and snow coming in just as you get back to the lodge for the for the meal afterwards. And you can sit in there, <laughs> as I say, with your fire going and watch that weather and think about the day that you've had. Well, I mean, what a perfect setup for the chat that we're going to have in a little while. But first, we've got some important stuff to do. The way we start all of these podcasts is to ask our guests, uh, what's that you're drinking? Well, I am drinking Butty Buck made by the Y Valley Brewery, which is a um, a brewery very close to my heart here in Herefordshire. They ha- they have a number of pubs, but but they have one pub um, in the in the town of Hereford called the Barrels. And I'm 57 years old. I've been going there since I was well, since I was probably 16. Probably shouldn't have <laughs> been there, but. Um, I don't think it has ever been decorated, but if you could bottle what that pub has, it is absolutely jam-packed from the ages of about 16-year-olds through to people beyond retirement um, every night of the week. It's very popular, great fun, and serves fantastic Y Valley beer. And I'm, I've chosen the Butty Back, which is as smooth as can be. You drink one, which I'm now drinking. You then have another. You then have another. <laughs> it's like a smooth wine, but by the time you get to the fourth or fifth, there's no coming back. And uh, so normally to be avoided. So, but I'm enjoying myself here with a, and Butty Buck in Welsh means little friend. Uh, so there we are. Ah, uh, very nice. And is it uh, an ale, a lager, or? It is a bitter. It is a bitter, yes, made with Herefordshire hops. Very nice. I've definitely had one, and it was definitely before or after a shoot, but I cannot for the life of me remember where. But maybe it was over in your direction. Well, now that you've laid the gauntlet down, chaps, when you're up here shooting with me in Herefordshire, we'll uh, (laughs) we'll invite. We'll have to make sure we uh, ply you with plenty of butty back, won't we? I I will definitely make sure I'm not moving house for that. (laughs) (laughs) No, absolutely. (laughs) George, what have you got? Have a guess. No, I've got I've got a whiskey. Um, <laughs> as per usual, I've got a glass of whiskey. I've got the Singleton today. Um, and I bought it because it's quite warm at the moment. And so whiskey doesn't feel necessarily quite right. But uh, it says on the outside of the box, which is what uh, swayed me, it says luscious nectar, which I thought was a <laughs> triumph of copywriting, if nothing else. Uh, so it's done its job. Um <laughs> it, it's from Dufftown. Uh, there's a salmon on the front, which is uh, obviously a good thing. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's very nice. I've actually had it in the fridge today because it's so hot <laughs> in my flat and I didn't want to have a warm whiskey. Um, it's probably not the done thing, but uh, it's very, very nice. It's going down very nicely. It's smooth. It's sweet. Really, really nice whiskey, actually. And then for when uh, I decide I've had enough whiskey, I've also got a, a bottle of Spanish lager. Um in an improvised beer cooler uh, to keep it cold so I don't have to go to the fridge partway through the recording. Chris, what have you got? So um, I'm getting quite into vodka and tonics uh, and it it definitely lends itself to the weather as well, uh, which when we're recording at the moment is outrageously hot. Um, So what I've done is I've organised a little taste test because I always come with too few drinks to a podcast. I've got two drinks. Uh, I've got... The Puffing Billy Steam Vodka, which John Fordyce from the Borders Distillery, who supplied the drinks for our Game Fair party, you know, he very kindly sent us a couple of bottles. So I've got the Puffing Billy Steam Vodka because it's really good, and I've had it before on the pod. A friend of mine gave me a bottle of Tovarich, which is some sort of Russian, apparently premium vodka. And I thought, right, great. I don't really know much about vodka tonic. Never really drunk too much before, so I'm going to have them too them together and see what they see what it tastes like so the tor- toverage i can tell they're working <laughs> i haven't even had a sip yet <laughs> um okay toverage yeah very nice it's good mm, puffing billy's better okay toverage i reckon traditional i really wouldn't really know what i'm talking about but i'm guessing but that puffing billy's got a lot more going on interesting that's really good just yeah, all I've got is a slice of lemon. It's actually really tasty. Nice. Anyway, so vodka and tonics. Got two of those. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, I slightly wish I'd thought of having a tonic-based drink as well because uh, I'm going to be... <laughs> uh, my flat is so hot, uh, and in order to avoid all the noise from outside, I have to close the, the doors and windows, so it's getting increasingly hot with every minute that we record, and I will be badly in need of a shower by the end of recording. Um, but uh, that's probably more than enough detail for anybody. Um, Shall we do Whose Bird Is It Anyway? Let's go. Great. Um, So, Tim, just in case you're not aware, 
uh, or for anybody who's new to the podcast. Whose Bird Is It Anyway is where we ask our listeners to send in their shooting dilemmas, quandaries, queries, and we try to resolve them and offer advice. Sometimes our advice is helpful. More often than not, it isn't. But uh, today's dilemma is from somebody we are calling Gideon, uh, and he writes, I have a problem that I hope you can help me with. I do a lot of shooting with my brother-in-law. He's a nice enough chap, but the poor fellow has absolutely no imagination. At the end of last season, I decided to treat myself, and I bought myself a completely new shooting jacket, breeks, and vest. I'm in the category of liking to match my tweeds. After showing my brother-in-law my purchase, I found out only a few weeks later that he's gone and bought the exact same attire. I'm all for matching myself, but not so keen on me and the brother-in-law matching at the same shoots. I'm not super bothered about the matching clothes, as I do have other tweeds I can wear on those shoot days when we are together, but here is my problem. I spent a long time over the off-season researching guns as I wanted an upgrade and finally decided on the gun I wanted to get. I went for a gun fit and had the stock made to measure for me, and when it arrived, the brother-in-law and I went down to the local playground to test it out. You and the listeners will know that feeling when you first try out your new gun. It was incredible. Later that evening, I found out that he had been complaining to the in-laws that there was no need for me to get a new gun, as my old gun worked perfectly fine and it wasn't the cheapest gun in the world. This, I must say, annoyed me a bit, but I never confronted him about going behind my back. What has annoyed me even more is that I got a message from him the other week saying that he wanted to upgrade his gun and is looking at the same one I purchased. I had put a lot of time and effort into choosing the gun that I liked and wanted, only for someone who can't do their own research to copy me again. Do I confront him saying that I'm not happy with his lack of imagination? Do I help him find a gun that is a completely different make or model than mine to save the confrontation? Or am I being silly here and this issue <laughs> wouldn't bother most people? Um, just quickly, there's absolutely no need to give this guy another name in Gideon and, and make him anonymous because there, surely there is only one brother-in-law out there that has gone and copied the, the, the other brother-in-law. <laughs> and if he listens to this, he absolutely knows we're talking about him. <laughs> well, he'll definitely have a suspicion, won't he? But Tim, what do you think? What would What would your well... reaction to this be? I think it'd be wonderful for them to be out in their in their matching tweeds and matching gun, and um, you know the the whole and have them draw the draw the the pegs next door to each other as well would be absolutely <laughs> fantastic. The interesting thing would be who would shoot the best, which brother-in-law would be the better shot, and uh, who would uh, who would shoot the high bird. So. I don't know. It's an interesting thing. I thought it was only the ladies who worried about were having the same dress, but I suppose <laughs> I've never actually seen two people turn up with the same tweeds on. So it would be quite. It would be great fun for everybody else if they turned up with the same tweeds on. Dearie me, they would never hear the end of it. And I think after that, both of them would probably make sure they always rang each other before, before they left for the day's shooting. Well, I think that's a very, very good point because I think you know probably quite fun to have the same tweets maybe but you would definitely be in the firing line for a bit of ribbing wouldn't you it's a, a the gun is an interesting one i have a a, a, a close friend who's an absolutely fantastic shot and uh, he bought the best browning that he could afford which was not you know not fantastic when he was 18 years old but it was the best he could afford. He's bought lots of guns since, and he's got some beautiful guns. But he always shoots with that first gun that he bought, and he is an amazing game shot and a very good clay shot. But then the interesting thing is, when you are out game shooting with him, you would never know what gun he's shooting with because when he unsleeves it on his peg, you're too far away to see, especially if you've got eyesight like I have. And otherwise, unless he's talking about it, it's in the sleeve. It could be any gun you like. Now, if he was a clay shooter and you're all stood there together waiting to you know, go on the, on the stand and shoot the clays and you've got all your guns out, well, then everybody sees the gun. And I do find it quite bizarre sometimes that you get the fancy clay gun and it's matte black with perhaps some gold lettering. <laughs> and you get a beautiful game gun with the most exquisite engraving 
and only you ever really see it unless you're going to be very unsubtle and tell everybody all about Indeed. it. Indeed, slightly ostentatious about it. Yes. Yeah. But but okay, but the fact is he has gone and copied him and that's that's got his so, so you're suggesting a bit of a sort of competition. That was your first suggestion, a bit of a competition. So maybe to develop that idea, maybe on a sort of clay shoot with all the rest of the syndicate, competition winner takes all. The other one has to go and get a new outfit and a new gun just so they don't match. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and like donate that. his gun and his, his outfit to the other brother. In <laughs> so he's got a pair of everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. The gun, as you say, the gun's for you, right? It's not for anybody else. The gun is for you. The tweeds, on the other hand, is much more of a personal statement. And, you know, I think if you go on any given shoot, three people are going to be shooting a silver pigeon anyway. So, you know, the, the probability that it's a problem is is relatively small. Um, I don't know. What do you think, Chris? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I I think I think he's he's got to get his own back. I just think his point is all about imagination. I agree with him. Like you know, get some imagination, choose your own stuff. I think what he should do is he suggest, suggest to his brother in law that he's found the perfect gun for him. He should ring up Nick Holt at Holt's. Tell him I. Ring Nick, tell him I told you to call him and say, look, stitch stitch my brother-in-law up with a totally knackered gun that's coming out of auction that's only good for parts, <laughs> but tell him it's the best thing ever. Get his brother-in-law to bid on this. Tell him, you know, got the whole gun it's talking. Absolute bargain, 50 uh, quid. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then turn off on the first day with his new gun that just doesn't work. Something like that. I think he's, he, we can't have him completely matching. I think you've got to screw him over somehow. Well, that's yeah. I've I've just been looking on your on the website, the Guns on Pegs website, at the what are the most desirable shotgun brands? Oh, you can come and, again. <laughs> and uh, well, it's interesting. If a gun I shoot with is not on there, doesn't re- doesn't doesn't rec- doesn't um, register anyway. But the gu- one of the guns that I do have, which is my absolute, the gun I do dearly love, is a Wesley Richards. And uh, being from being from up in the Midlands. I always thought if ever I was going to go for a best gun, I wouldn't go for a London gun. I think I'd have to take myself off to Birmingham and go for a Wesley Richards. But at the game fair one time, um, I was in a stand trying some Brownings and uh, they're a bit short. And he said, well, you can have a pad. You can have a pad on the back. I said, oh, I'm not really sure. I don't really want a thick pad. He said, have a look at this. So I picked this side by side up and lifted it. Oh, that's lovely. And as I put it back, I said, what, what make is that gun? He said, oh, it's a... It is a Wesley. I said, Ooh, very interesting. Anyway, I bought the Brownings, went down, had the pads done, went to pick them up. And when I was in the in the shop and uh, I said, um, you haven't, did you ever sell that Wesley Richards? He said, no, we didn't. So he got the Wesley Richards out. Beautiful. 32 inch barrel, side by side, high, um, live pigeon gun with a raised center rib on it. Um, and the, and the, the drop lock made in 1927. And wow. I said, "Oh dear, game over." I was, I was sold. <laughs> I don't shoot with it on a regular basis, but it's a beautiful gun to have. And I think, you know, like you say, you need some imagination, don't you? You need to think about why would you? You've got to try and find something a little bit different in a way. And that's, uh, and sometimes that's the fun and the beauty of a gun, isn't it? If it's just a little bit different, and you really enjoy it. Now, then it all comes back to what can you shoot and what can you hit with? And then it doesn't really matter what gun it is, does it? It's it's what well, I started off sh- shooting with, a ba- with an old Bakel and I could actually shoot quite well then. And then I came, I, I left the sport for about 20 years, came back and I, I couldn't hit a barn door if I was shut inside. And I wondered what on earth was going on and found out that um, I'd sort of, my eyesight had changed. I became left eye dominant, which I had no idea what that was at the time. And I was... Uh, taught by um, a gentleman called Nick Hollick and managed to persuade me to move to shoot off the left shoulder and things oh, wow. have slightly slightly improved so I, I'm a right hander shooting off the left shoulder but uh, I'm never going to damage the, any bag to any great extent but I do enjoy myself. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so George can you summarize then uh, what we're going to say to Gideon what, what, what's the final bit of advice then? Um, the final bit of advice is the gun is for you the gun is a personal thing. If somebody else has copied your choice of gun, I personally would take that as a compliment. Um, I suppose I probably would do with the tweeds as well, but I'd be a little bit more put out about it because I do think as as of the tweed as being much more a kind of personal expression for everybody else to experience, whether they enjoy it or not is another matter. But the gun, that's for me. 
so I wouldn't be too worried about the gun. But maybe I would help my friend with his lack of imagination and say, look, let's see if we can find a gun that really expresses your personality and find him the most boring gun imaginable. <laughs> That's a good idea. Tell, yeah, uh, I think I think I do still have my bacon. <laughs> well, right, Tim, <laughs> Tim's bacon for a, for a bargain price is on its way to Gideon. Uh, <laughs> we'll uh, get into it. We'll, we'll drop him back some suggestions in an email and a few links, and then we can sort out and see where that one goes to. Um, so moving on, um, this latest addition to this series is this is this feature which uh, found a home. Uh, quite quickly, uh, called Unpopular Opinions. Uh, And this unpopular opinion comes from Silas. Is that a genuine name, George? You've written this here for me. No, I've made it up. Okay, good. (laughs) Um, It's to to go with Gideon. (laughs) Silas, yeah. yeah. (laughs) I want to know about your theming. Anyway, come back to that. Uh, He says, uh, lots of people get very excited about what cartridges they're using, but I don't think it makes any difference at all what cartridges you use. And there's not much a bog standard 28 gram of number six shot won't deal with. Discuss. Um, I think Silas knows me and he's just trying to wind me up. (laughs) (laughs) I think Um, think this is an interesting one. I mean, look, there's no denying that for certain kinds of shooting, you need something a bit more than a 28 gram six. But I think that what his point is, is that for most driven shooting, in the UK, the 28 grams of six is okay. And my inclination is to agree with that. I would say that most people are not shooting 40-yard pheasants. And even if they were, they'd probably be okay with a 28 gram six. Most people are shooting 20 to 30-yard pheasants, and that will be absolutely fine. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Most people who think they've shot a 40-yard pheasant have just shot a 20-yard pheasant. Uh, <laughs> that, that's like where I'd start this conversation. However, there's probably a whole podcast episode in this alone, and I get I get a bit hot under the collar with all this sort of stuff. Uh, but I do think you should know what that cartridge does with your gun at different ranges. I think that's the right thing to know, given that you're shooting live game and being ethical about it, you you should just at least have an understanding of what that cartridge does with your gun. So Chris, you see it all the time. Have you been out and shot a pattern plate with your gun and your favourite choice of load? Uh, Absolutely. I I mean, how how much detail do you want? Uh, As little as you can give me. (laughs) (laughs) I've I've taken a variation of uh, all of the sort of okay. So I've got a Henry Atkins side by side uh, for for most stuff. If I go on some really high pheasants, I'll take something else and borrow something from someone, which can take a bit more than than I would through the side by side. So I'll use a twenty eight or a thirty gram uh, six five, depending on time of year. But they all act differently, and it depends on the chokes of your gun. The chokes of my gun are fixed. So I took uh, I took. Uh, uh, different loads from different brands and tested them all and even one brand to another 28 gram six to another 28 gram six came out of my gun totally differently uh and where and did you end up what did you end up with as your choice of load i'm just not saying sorry <laughs> <laughs> now look uh, we we is work that with a num- they're not is that is that because they're not a client <laughs> <laughs> Look, um, we work with a number of different cartridge companies, uh, and I'll leave it at that. Um, but uh, <laughs> um, no, I, I found a cartridge which suits my gun very nicely, and I would encourage others to do the same. Um, it's quite amazing the difference on a pattern plate from one gun. And actually, I did it with Frank, uh, who works with us, and he found through his gun, which is very similar to mine in terms of its style and its build. It's an AYA, though. Um and same chokes came out totally differently with the same cartridges. Um, Very and interesting. It, and we counted the, the the number of pieces of shot in, inside the ring and everything else. So yeah, yeah. So yeah, obviously I'm a bit of a geek over this, and I'd encourage others to just just not maybe do all that, but just do something just to understand a little bit because you'll be amazed. Yeah, it's interesting. Now I use a three eighths and three eighths while I shoot as as choke just on when I'm game shooting, virtually on everything. And and a, and a cartridge I'm just happy with, and I find I tend not to 
change and uh, and I think it, some of it is psychological. I'm not I'm sure I probably don't shoot any worse or any better with different cartridges possibly, but that's very interesting. I'll have to try that, get the pattern plate out and test them all out and see what does actually yeah, definitely what does work the best through the gun. But now of course you're you're sort of Herefordshire, Wales, you know, you've got a bit slightly steeper countryside than Chris in Kent or me in Hampshire. So, you know, you're going to need something a probably a bit bit punchier yeah. than 28 grams of six. We've got some thought. nice, um, some nice hills on the syndicates I'm on, and we get some decent high birds. And uh, yeah, it's very, you know, it's a very satisfying if you clean, kill one clean. Indeed. I think for the purposes of those that are a bit unsure about what we're talking about or building up their knowledge, but everything <laughs> we were just referring to was 12 bores. Oh, yeah. Because uh, <laughs> absolutely. It, I have friends with, with 16 bores, and I tell you, when we went again, goose shooting, the big, the grand uh, Kenchester goose shoot, we um, I had a friend with an AYA, 20, 28 inch barrel, 16 bore. He just, with a, with a uh, three quarter choke, he brought them down absolutely clean. Absolutely. Sounds clean. like a very yeah, nice gun. Kind of, they were a good height. So, but we must, I must say, it's, at the moment, we are getting literally, it would be, a thousand plus a night flying straight over us. It is just wow. unbelievable. They go across at about seven to eight o'clock. And then at about 9.30, they all head back the other way. Then at six o'clock in the morning, they head back out the other way. And nine o'clock, they head back. It's like we are on the, the tram Tim, line you're going to need the ultimate shoot lodge just to rest in in between these flights. So uh, I think... <laughs> I think we... <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Right, so we better crack on, hadn't we? Right, so before we do that... Uh, Gideon and Silas are now inducted into the most noble order of the garters and will shortly be in receipt of their very own set of the highly desirable Guns on Pegs podcast shooting sock garters. So if you too have a shooting confession, quandary or query that you'd like us and our guests to help you with or an unpopular opinion that you'd like to share and you'd like a set of the garters, uh, drop us an email to pod at gunsonpegs.com and if we use what you've sent us uh, we will get some garters in the post to you but uh, as Chris alluded to I think it's probably about time that we talked about shoot lodges Chris do you want to yeah, we've already given a bit of background but do you want to just give a little yeah. bit more well I think <clears throat> so, so this ultimate shoot lodge and uh, I'm a complete lightweight and vodka and tonic's probably going to have an impact quite quickly so it's going to get it will get out of hand but uh, we, we, we're going to formulate it through this discussion and obviously it's going to be built around an oak frame because that's Tim's speciality that's what he's been doing forever uh, but after that Tim has suggested that uh, he's going to go away and ask his team to sort of work on some plans for this so we, we, we it looks like we're probably going to be able to have an article to follow up to this but most importantly when we finish, Tim, I'm really keen for you to stab in the dark and price this up so that those who get really excited by this and have the means to do something about it uh, <laughs> can, can, can know, know where they're aiming. I think that's going to be really important. Yeah. Well, we've um, built many buildings. And I, funny, while, while we've been talking, I've just been thinking about all the different barn style buildings we built and, the, and one that would really lend itself to being a shoot lodge. And over in Cambridge, we built a beautiful barn for a farmer, and it was um, originally as a farm building, um, with, but it had a floated concrete floor, insulated floor inside, and it was obviously going to be something else. Now, that did actually become an occasional wedding venue, but it would have made the most magnificent shooting lodge and i think i might have to pop back over and call in <laughs> next day, have a look and see how it's looking because that could be the one we'll, i'll bring the model of that up i'll find out whatever the gentleman's name is david i'll find out what david did with the barn eventually and i'll have a look and see what the, our team think they could do we have a lot of uh, very keen uh, keen shooters amongst the team uh, clay pigeon and, and gay good so we'll have a chat, get them together, and see what what could we bring together as the dream lodge. Well, I think what we'd probably better do first of all is just define what we mean by shoot lodge. Um, Chris, you go first. What do you think we mean by shoot lodge? Oh God. Okay, so my my t uh, feeling about a shoot lodge, and certainly in respect of this podcast, is quite elaborate compared to what most people might be thinking. I think a shoot lodge could be right the way up to include accommodation. I think it could be where you stay. 
it depends how elaborate we're getting. And I think this one could go that way. So we can come back to that discussion about whether it is something where you stay. But it certainly is, it's got everything. For me, a shoot lodge is sort of, it's the place you meet at the start of the day. It's the place you go back to for Levenses, potentially. Certainly place you have lunch before, uh, you know, during the day or after the day and, and tea at the end of the day as well. Uh, but it's it's really like the place that kicks off the atmosphere. And it's, you know, everyone meets there. The, the beaters meet there as well. The keepers there. You get your birds there afterwards, all that sort of stuff. So a shoot lodge for me is that, but it's I think it's got to have accommodation. So I'm going quite lavish. Okay. Does that make any sense? Uh, uh, well, <laughs> I, I'm going to forego judgment. Uh, Tim, what do you think a, a shoot lodge is? What's your definition? Well, it's interesting when Chris men- mentions accommodation. Um, I hadn't really thought of accommodation as such. I am. I imagine the, the, the lodge as the day. The day, it is the part of the day. It's the shoot. It's the, the meat in the morning. It's the breakfast. It's creating the atmosphere. I would. I think it needs to have a big open fire, if possible. And uh, well, oh no, not possible. Definitely <laughs> has to have a big open fire there. There needs to be somewhere where, when you come back, if you had a really soaking wet day, you can hang your coats up, hang the hang the boots up, and so on. And um, it needs somewhere for the birds, possibly there might maybe store as well. Somewhere you could safe storage for the guns, so you can go and relax. And then, ideally. It's quite nice to go up to a raised area, I think, with a with a glazed area overlooking, ideally looking across a lovely part of the chute. So you've got a great view. We're getting dangerously into all the different features we need in the ultimate chute lodge. So I'm gonna I'm gonna hold you there. Uh, I, I think we're on the same page. It's just that the building I had in mind was just that little bit bigger with the accommodation. But I'm absolutely <laughs> with you. Without accommodation, I'm totally with you, Tim. George, how about you? Well, I mean, as you know, Chris, you shoot at far fancier places than I do. Um, and most of my shooting is on, you know, little farm shoots, syndicates, that kind of thing. But I think, broadly speaking, the shoot lodge is, as you say, where you meet in the morning, where you go back to for 11s is, possibly where you have lunch if that's not in the farmhouse or something like that. So it's kind of, I guess I feel like it's kind of the hub of the shoot and it might well be that you're staying somewhere else. It might be that you're shooting quite close to home, so you're not staying the night. But it's it's the hub of the day. Um, and I suppose, like when we're des- when we're designing and imagining our ultimate shoot lodge, what I hope is that what we finish up with is something that maintains that uh, sort of rustic feel. So you know. Most of the places I go to, what you'd call the shoot lodge is really a barn. And you're fortunate if there isn't actually a tractor in there at the time. Um, So I'm hoping that what we come up with is it maintains some of that barn-like feel. And actually, Tim, you used a really lovely phrase at the beginning. Did you say cathedral of the countryside? What a wonderful (laughs) phrase. So that's what I'm hoping we end up with is this kind of cathedral to shooting. Uh, and and but that it but that it feels luxurious, but has echoes of that kind of grassroots syndicate <laughs> shooting where you're eating a pork pie, sitting on a bale of straw, uh, that you and the, you brought the pork pie with you, kind of thing. I think that's like I can totally see the desire to have a kind of big kind of hunting lodge situation like you might find on the continent, but that is. For me, a hunting lodge is a different thing from a shoot lodge, if that makes sense. I know what you're getting at in terms of rustic, George, but if Oakwrights are going to build you a nice new shoot lodge, you're definitely not going to be putting your tractor in the middle of it in the first week. Are no, you? no, you're not going to be putting your tractor in there. But I hope that there are. I hope that you feel like you potentially could do if you wanted. <laughs> I remember once though in an old barn up um, in the Welsh Valleys there, at Tregoid. Yeah. I don't know if you know, if you if you ever come across Tregoid, there they used to have their uh, meat in a barn up an old track. You went up the old track, and this little barn was there. So it was very compact. There wasn't a lot of space. You had to squeeze in, but there was a fire, and the kitchen was overlooking where you ate, and uh, they would serve the drinks from there as well. And it was great fun. So that was on the very rustic side and a very, but it was good fun. But if you want a little bit more space, again, you can just expand that barn out, give the fireplace a bit more space. You can sit around a fireplace 
and uh, you know get the fire going. And you know some nice easy chairs, I would imagine, around the fireplace. So you can have a drink, a bar. So you can have your drink. You have your pre-meal drinks. Then you move across to the, the dining table and you're sitting back with space. You're eating the meal after the shoot, your beautiful meal there. You're feeling content and not, the cigars go around. <laughs> and then you might just glide back to the open fireplace talking about who had the best shot of the day and uh, with certain friends of mine who who had the low shot of the day and <laughs> things like that and giving them lots of stick. Um and you want to, it's just when you're sitting there and you're gazing up, looking above, and you can see the purlins, the trusses, the rafters of the oak frame above you. And the great thing with an oak frame is the oldest frame I ever worked on was dated back to 12, 1280. Wow. And it was in a church. It did need some love. It needed a lot of love. But it was still there. And you just stand and you look and you think, what stories could this frame tell? And that's the sort of shooting lodge I think we would love to create. We'd like to create where those oak beams could tell lots of stories about lots of real shooting characters. That's what we want yeah, to create. So, Tim, you've mentioned um, examples already. You, you, you've mentioned Chagoyd. And I, I think before before we kick on any further, I think it's really important that we maybe give a shout out to a few of the sort of lodges that maybe inspire us here in this discussion. Because I've I've been very lucky to have been to a few places that I think definitely deserve a mention at this point. Uh, and I'm keen to just get your opinion on any others. Uh, there's there's a particular... So they've had a couple of mentions on the podcast. Actually, it's uh, it's the owner, Toby Fitchner Irvine's birthday today. But the Isle of Muck, uh, up in the Western Isles of Scotland, has, I think, the best shoot lodge I've ever been to. Uh, and, th- and that... Uh, well, it's got accommodation as well, so probably come back to it. But it's definitely just it's built around this central, uh, central sort of um, entertaining area. The, the the sort of two seating areas, raised fire, raised wood burner in the middle, uh, and then the, the dining area, and then all the bedrooms are sort of off the side and up above. Uh, and that, they've just done an amazing job. But it was also got a hell of a view. Um, but I think there's a few others, like so the Bettis Hall lodges for anyone that's ever been to those. I went to there one. I very had a lucky invite from a, a, a gentleman. Um, I hope you heard of my mention, Paul Tuckwell, great friend who invited me um, on a day shooting, and it, and it was. A, and I said, "Oh, Paul, I'm a, I'm a bit busy, really can't." And he said, "Well, Tim, it is. You know, I, I think actually I might squeeze it in." And they had a wonderful time, and that obviously did have accommodation. It was it was superb. It was run yeah. very well. It was very friendly. It was very relaxed. And it did. We had the open fire downstairs there, the group of guns, a meal, lovely lady looked after us, served the meal. We had a great time. So that was um that that was very, yeah, very, very, very well organized, very good. So it's good it's fun. the style, but also the organization that, and that's probably a topic we won't even get onto. Absolutely. But yeah, the so better Hall lodges are very good. But then you've got sort of things like uh Let Weddigarth always get noted for their elevenses. And they could, that, that's in their sort of shoot lodge. Um, but it's not the sort of shoot lodge that maybe we're talking about. It's very much designed, pitched at the Elevenses side of things. And that's really awesome. And they've gone and put that right in the shoot and the best place to have Elevenses. And yeah, that, that's a sort of different angle on it. Uh, I mean, there's so many out there. George, have you have you got sort of any that spring to mind where you think, and you go back to your rustic feel, the ones that you just think, well, yeah, they deserve the credit. Yeah, I mean, um, they, they're barns, basically. They are they are literally barns and they are where, you know, maybe they're grain stores or tractor sheds or whatever. But typically they are places where everybody on the day comes together at Elevenses. Beaters, pickers up, guns, hangers on. Everybody comes together, little nipper slow gin, sausage, sausage roll or pork pie or whatever it might turn out to be. And they are... They are the moment where everybody comes together. I've just got to say, there's a, a friend of ours nearby, uh, a neighbouring farmer to us, who um, has uh, has a little shoot, a bit like ours, slightly on a slightly bigger scale. Um, and he, they do elevenses in the in the tractor shed, or in, it might be the grain store. And um, he serves what he calls "taste the difference" slow gin. <laughs> and the difference is that it was made in an old roundup barrel and you can taste the difference let me tell you um, oh my god <laughs> <laughs> it's that that's kind ridiculous. of that's the vibe that i like 
and you know when we shoot at home it, you know the 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 shoot lodge is basically my brother's garage where he parks his car um you know that that kind of thing but it's it's the it's the central hub i haven't experienced these kind of grand shoot lodges in the same way that you guys have um but i think that the the vibe the the the, the, the atmosphere is really the important thing and you know i think that it, if we can maintain that vibe that atmosphere that sense of community that place where everybody comes together for a bit of a chin wag something nice to eat then that's what that what we're really aiming for you just on on that i would say that i absolutely agree locally and it's it's always the people you know isn't it i think shooting's about friends it's about community um there's a uh, some good friends of a shoot um, up at a place called Shobden Manor Farm shoot. I will say probably one of the millions of Manor Farm shoots. Um, but Andrew and, and Ed and his and his father Roger they they run this shoot and the, the lodge is built out of an old barn. It is a, a, um, a converted barn, so it's got a great an, an oak frame. It's got the the hunting trophies in there which they bought from an old uh, manor house close by. Um, and it has got the big open fire. But what makes that, though, as well as the atmosphere of the barn, it is the people. It's the people who are hosting the shoot. Roger comes in the shoot bus, the father, and he's always interested, always has a chat to you, and is always very kind to me when I keep missing <laughs> the birds. And that what is what makes the – and I remember the last time I went there – I went with my nephew and, a, and another who works for the company and another lad who works for the company. We had a fantastic day shooting. And I will say that I ended up feeling rather poorly on the way home. <laughs> we had a fantastic day. I probably had a few too many butty backs, but the atmosphere, the big fire was going, great friends, great hosts, the barn structure. And that is, you know, but it was the meal. They had the bar inside. The meal was served. Great facilities, and it was it was just it created the atmosphere of the day, along with the hosts. So I think, like, okay, we've talked about places that we've been, and we'll definitely draw inspiration from those places. But I think it's time we started talking about the things that our imaginary ultimate shoot lodge is going is going to have. So. I'm going to kick things but off. But it's not just going to be imaginary because Tim's going to bring it to life. So, yeah, go. Well, okay, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so I'm going to kick things off. Tim, you have mentioned the fire several times, and I completely agree that we need a proper open fire. But my idea for what makes this, a, what makes this different is that one of the problems with a fireplace is that there's limited space around it. So what I'm thinking is that we go for a central fireplace, circular fireplace, kind of like in a Viking longhouse kind of thing <laughs> with like a hole in the roof for the smoke. Yeah. Um, so like this, this is what we need. The, it's the detail that's going to make this the ultimate shoot lodge. So, you know, obviously there's things that every shoot lodge is going to need to have, you know, gun storage. We've touched on some of them before. Gun storage, seating area, dining area. So what is it that's going to, what are the little tweaks that are going to make this shoot lodge really special? Chris. So if I, I, I'm with you. The fireplace for me is absolutely central to this shoot lodge. The, the best ones I've always seen have been wood burners in the right place. Actually, there's been open fires that have worked well too, but the only problem with an open fire is it doesn't quite generate as much heat as the wood burner. Uh, but uh, but yeah, I'm happy with your suggestion, George. I think that is an absolute winner. And you've all, you know, ideally some sort of seating around it so that it's all raised because inevitably um, you need somewhere to like, you know, you'll start steaming when you come back in after a wet day and you can all sit around that having a drink or whatever. Uh, that That's just got to be perfect. And, and And for me, central to the whole thing. Okay, so another thing that a uh, shoot lodge obviously needs is a bar. So, Tim, what do you think makes a, the perfect bar for a shoot lodge? Well, you need a good selection of drink, obviously, as much as you can lay your hands on. Um, but uh, uh, the bar, <laughs> yes, you need you need a good bar, and it's where you position the bar. So I think you probably, and it's interesting because you're going to come in, you're going to be wet. You might be, if you are on a higher level, you're going to rise up the stairs, 
you're going to stand around. You probably want to um, have your bar somewhere not too far away, along with your – you could have your then your central fireplace. So you would come up, you chat, you get a drink, you gently move across around the circular fireplace, and then you move on and you've got your dining table. Now, you could also, if it's a long barn, you could have another fireplace on the gable. So you sort of at the end of the at the end of the, the <laughs> dining table, you have a, another fireplace if you're really going to go for it. I always think yeah. it would be you need Definitely. good artwork. I think <laughs> in a shooting lodge, good artwork with a theme, Ooh, a yes. story, something. I remember I went up to Old Car um, one time shooting up there, and my my wife's father used to judge the Waterloo Cup, and when he passed away, I um, wow. sort of was uh, handed down his beautiful old tweed jackets not his hunting pigs but his beautiful old tweed jackets and they were absolutely thick and weighed a ton and um when i went up there to shoot it was unbelievably cold and i rang my wife i said my goodness i know why your father had these jackets now because boy oh boy am i cold <laughs> but there the shooting lodge had some great artwork refer to it was on the grounds where the waterloo cup was run so the artwork referred back to the waterloo cup so if you could have artwork that you know, gives history of the shoot or history of the characters or people who've been on the shoot or associated with the shoot i think some good artwork that lends a story so i think the shoot lodge in a way wants to tell a story so the only problem with that suggestion, and I'm all for it, is that you could have just blown the budget well out of the water with artwork. What you... budget? <laughs> what budget? I mean, you, you could spend a million quid in your shoot lodge and like six million quid in your artwork. <laughs> yeah. Why not? You, only, you yeah. only live once. Okay, so artwork, uh, yeah, I think you're setting, and by the way, the second fire, that's in already. I love that idea. Uh, the, so so you, you described that journey into the shoot lodge. I really like that bit. The seating area in relation to the bar and the fire is critical. Uh, and you've got two seating areas here. You've got the sort of dining area. And the seat. If I go for the sort of first seating area, the sofa type space, I think if you've got the fire at the end that you mentioned, the fire in the middle, actually, maybe you do bar at the end, big seating area at the middle, uh, there uh, next, and then the fire in the middle. And then the other side, you go dining. Hey. Don't worry, Chris. I've been. I sat down with one of our one of our girls, and I said, "Right on the shooting, let's just set this all out." And I and after five minutes, I thought, "Hmm, this is slightly more challenging than you think." <laughs> if you want the absolute perfect set setup, this is going to take a little bit more thought. It's not just a five minute job because nothing. You sort of want your seating area to be comfortable for before yeah. you eat and a fire but then you want your area to be comfortable while you're eating with the dining table but then where do you go and sit do you go back to sit where you were sitting do you where should the bar be should it be for after the meal or before the meal where are your coats going to hang do your coats hang downstairs out of the way and is there's a lot of things to think okay. about so well and then so the <laughs> other point is is that i think that your 11s is area needs to be a sort of roofed over outdoors bit <laughs> because you don't want to have to take your wellies off, do you? So Elevens' area is different from lunch area. So I think, yeah. you know, an outside space is also quite important, probably with another, like a fire pit or, a, or what have you. And Yeah. Okay, so... So, so just a... so just quickly, got to summarise what we've got so far. Then we we've got awesome fire fireplace central to the thing. We've got a huge, great seating area, and that's got to have enough seating to sort of host like everyone plus any potential other guest non shooting guests that are there as well. We've got a bar, a big bar. Uh, we've got two t- two two fireplaces actually. We've now got an outside uh elevens is area because I completely agree, George. Somewhere where you're not having to take your boots off, weather dependent. You never really know. Uh, that's happening. Um, there's a bunch of bunch of other things that we need to bring into this. We haven't talked about the gun room. Well, I think the gun, the gun room's interesting because back to the our, you know, our brothers-in-law who have sort of had the same gun. We don't know sort of what the engraving was like on the gun or what the what the if it's been off to have your stock made for you. It's going to be some beautiful walnut on the stock. Would you have um, a gun room or gun cabinets? in the lodge in an exposed area where you could put the guns in with glazed secure glazing and you could actually see the guns now would you would you well i think that's really nice and 
I think that's really nice, and I know just the man to to do that as well because uh, a few. Well, I can't remember how long ago it was actually, but uh, there's a chap who runs a company called the Bespoke Gun Cabinets Company, and they have these incredible glass fronted uh, gun cabinets where the glass is more or less, you know, bomb proof. Um, and they are, you know, he's a proper like joiner and, you know, really, really beautifully made cabinets with these glass fronts that at the touch of a button they can go opaque and you know really nice so yeah i mean you've got to have one of those in i think there. every game fair i wander onto that stand and go and admire the cabinet and think one day <laughs> one day i will have one of these okay so one of those is going in but you've got to have this sort of changing area when you know when you come back in in your boots you've got to be able to uh, access somewhere where you're going to hang your coat up put the gun in an area store your cartridges stick all your stuff down have your shoes then that you put on for for this fancy meal in this area that we've just gone and created like an airlock i think if it's the ultimate you would you would you would come in to a lower level you would kick off your boots take off your coat you hang them almost in a drying room so it'd be a warm room where it's going to dry or a room you'd hang and you kind of, it'd be oh, on yeah. drying the drying the gear um you would then give your gun to the to, the, to, to our man who's going to clean clean your gun <laughs> and uh <laughs> with a little tag on, and then after your gun will be placed uh, upstairs in this uh, on display shooting cabinet. If we're going to be really ostentatious, and we're going to have the gun with your name on or a name tag, and uh, it would be there. Or perhaps you could be slightly more subtle and not have a name tag, but you could have the guns on display. <laughs> so you could just wander and look and admire. Because on a day's game, you never you never see the guns, do you? Okay, so we've got a drying room, individual lockers for the, everyone to store their stuff, uh, uh, and upstairs, uh, fancy gun area, all on displays. And actually, so that must be somewhere you're going to go and have drinks, because then you do get a chance to look at all these guns yeah. as well. So, so that would need perfect. to be by the bar, perhaps over the first area you come into. Now, you mentioned the the um, Elevenses, and, and that's an interesting one. Where we had always been to one shoot um, down in the Forest of Dean called Bishop's Wood, where we'd always go back for a meal, but with the lockdown, decided to eat outside. So with that, uh, overlooking a, a lovely trout lake, and Richard, who runs the shoot there, saying, Tim, you know, what we could really do with is a love, this is working really well, great big fire pit, but if it's raining, it's not quite so much fun. Could you could you supply an, an oak frame building for just an over covered building? So I said, well, hey, I think I'll have a think about that. And I thought, wow, we've got an old show frame, which would be just the ticket. So Richard came along and had a look and said, yeah, absolutely. So we haggled doing the deal. And in the end, we agreed for a, a day shooting for a team for in, in um, exchange for this lovely oak frame. And Richard said, right, okay, we'll, we'll do the deal. You need to you need to let me know. Let's get this deal done. Let's get the day the day sorted. So like all things, I thought, yes, I must ring Richard. I must ring Richard. Didn't ring. And about three weeks later, I rang and said, right, okay, done the deal i'll agree you can have the frame for day shooting no problem he said right okay season 22 23 when would you like your day i said richard <laughs> that's not this year that's next year that's what no this year we agreed he said we did tim but i told you get on with it and he said they are absolutely full and he thinks, what happened? We missed that. We missed the last month of the season last year. And as we all glide into our last last sort of few weeks of a shoot season, we normally think, "My God, I've done too much." And I think because we had it cut off, I think suddenly everyone was thinking, "Crikey, I'm not getting any younger. I just need to do more." And he said exactly that. People who had booked two days were booking three days. People who had booked a day would book two days. I left it a few weeks. No space. No space yeah. to be in. Okay, so you. So you're going to turn up to this oak frame shoot lodge that he's created just for all of his syndicate days and just sort of sit there and then corner and Absolutely. enjoy the atmosphere. Overlooking the trout lake. <laughs> It'll be a great spot. Yeah. Right, hang on. If you've got a trout lake, which we should definitely have, you need a rod yeah. room as well. <laughs> 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 I think I think rod room, gun room, gallery area yeah. up top. That's got to work because you could use the height of the eaves Absolutely. for what, the rods. What a well, great way you? to spend your time while you're waiting for the shoot lunch to be served than having a little bit of a flick just to see if off, you can... Off the gallery, down to, <laughs> down to the dining table. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. okay, but, uh, but we, I, I mentioned waiting for, for the shoot lunch, right? Um, the dining area, I think, is a really interesting point because... At most shoot lunches that you go to, you're sitting at a, a, a big, long table. Actually, not just shoot lunches, like dinner parties and stuff. But you're sitting at a big, long table. 
And I kind of feel like that is a bit of a weakness because you can only speak to the kind of four or five people who are nearby. So I kind of feel like you need... I'm going back to the same theory as I had with the fireplace. You need a, some sort of circular situation going on. You just want the whole turreted shoot yeah. lodge, don't I basically, you? The whole shoot things. lodge is going to have to be round. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, but I, I, I know feel like there, needs to, there needs to be uh, like you need to be able to make eye contact yeah. with everyone yeah. around the table. Yeah, no, I, I know what you mean. Fine, sick of sick Move of around the table. Every Why not? <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, you, you, they should they should do that. It should peg out lunch spots, and then you'd have different. You draw a different peg for lunch, so you're not next to the same people you shop. Have with, you ever? And then you, you move up to. Yeah. And so on. You know, there's all the different ways of doing your. You know, move up three or whatever. Different ways of doing this. Yeah. Um, a friend of mine says, uh, "Move uh, up three, down one." Just to <laughs> just to see who's paying just attention. Just to confuse people. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, for those listening, Google the Durnford wheel as a way of of, of moving around on pegs. Uh, that's a, that's an awesome one that you'll find on our website. Right, so outdoor area. Just going on from the outdoor area a second. So we've got this awesome, we've got the trout lake, you know, the whole thing sorted. Uh, one thing I thought that I've never seen, because it's ridiculous, maybe, but I've never seen, but I quite like, is for each car to be able to pull up in a sort of, underneath a sort of cat slide roof off the back of the chute lodge so that every single car is undercover and it's got their sort of own like loading bay almost so when you come in on a rainy day and you get out of the car and you run into the front door you don't have any of that it's just supreme luxury you're permanently undercover and then you go straight in through the back door so you've got a, like an overhang like a sort of cat side roof overhang with oak frame holding it up and then the back door is sort of underneath what do you well, think well i suppose if you had this you could have that that cat slide coming off the the wing that is your lodges or your rooms. So you pull up in your with your named space under your cat slide with an oak frame <laughs> and the door ahead of you is the door to your lodge. So you go and place your evening bag or your weekend bag in there and then you glide down a, another corridor or, or a cat slide on the other side, glide down into the main shoot lodge. Oh, that's perfect. But what you also need, right. assuming that you've got a gun bus, is the other side... You need one of those kind of covered areas like you find at fancy hotels. Port Cassage, is it called? That it, well, yeah. yeah, exactly those words. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> where so so that your gun bus delivers you to the front door of the lodge uh, under cover, um, but it's obviously got that's got to be quite a big that space. Would so, yeah, frame, I think that's... that would come out as a, as the big gable, the old threshing gable that came off the side of the barn. Yeah. You just bring that on out, so you just come under like it would look like an extended threshing gable or barn, or the whether whether cart would have gone into the barn for a threshing barn, so you could come under there. That could be yeah, absolutely beautiful. Uh, <laughs> your one suggestion just back then, Tim, about each person having their own entrance, <laughs> going up to their own room. I mean, if we're chucking accommodation in, this thing has just got... I mean, you basically just described the hotel. Uh, we, we, but it, sound, it sounds awesome. And I love the idea of having the sort of gun bus thing the other side to where the cars pull up. And yeah, it's just really cool. Okay. Uh, the bit we haven't discussed, though, outside is the sort of game larder beaters area so that we can combine this whole thing together for the atmosphere on the day how on earth are we going to do that we've got a lot of outside well, space I, going I, on i think that that's where this um the the outdoor elevens is space like for me elevens is where everybody comes together and so yeah. this outdoor space uh is p- absolutely perfect for that obviously later in the day you're going to have your shoot lunch now depending on the style of shoot, maybe all the beaters and pickers up are part of that big shoot lunch. If not, we obviously need a, a, a beat, a, like a, I guess you call it the head keepers shoot lunch room or something like that. <laughs> the whole thing times two for, well, for the keeper. Basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I think you definitely need this congregational space outside. You need the sort of the game larder, the chiller joined on to the side so that, you'll go and get your game at the end of the day. Uh, and as you say, it's got to be near the Elevenses area. You need that. And when the weather's good, you'll all be outside for Elevenses all joining together. Uh, uh, do you know what? The that, other the other thing is that you're going to need is you're going to need some sort of kennels situation. Absolutely. 
There we are. It's more an, an oak frame if it's... panel. That would be the. Uh, oh. <laughs> Can you imagine the, the oh, tooth marks yes. in the bottom of those? <laughs> and I think, as you say, George, it is. I think back to community and shooting to bring all the 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 beaters, the pickers up, and the, everybody together at the, perhaps the morning when you get there for your cup of coffee to start off. You're all having a good chat all together. You need some space for that, so you could almost have a downstairs big area again with another fireplace. Um, perhaps cobbled floor or flags floor downstairs where you'd meet with everybody just to get everybody together, chat to everybody. You might be on a shoot where you've got loaders and you're chatting to the loader and the, the chaps and in, talking to the beaters. It's it's great to meet everybody who's involved. So you need a big space for that where everybody feels comfortable, relaxed. And then you perhaps have the upstairs for the later lunch, for the shoot lunch later and the and the bar there later. But downstairs, if we're really going for it, let's have a big communal space downstairs where we, and it could be where you could throw doors open where you might be meeting in your shooting gear, you're warm anyway, and it could be open perhaps just with a fire going or a big fire pit outside as well. You're wandering outside, big veranda and uh, and, and the, the whole the whole team together. Yeah. You've just turned my whole imagination on its head, Tim. It's absolutely, you've defined it in my head perfectly in that this downstairs area is just, it's just, it's just awesome entertainment yeah. for the day. Bit more rustic, but bit George's big open fire in there, definitely a bar. But then upstairs, massive, great sort of mezzanine yeah. balcony type thing. Uh, and then you've got the same thing again, but for the sort of more formal occasion, maybe for the, for the evening, if you're, you know, or for the lunch or whatever. Ah, oh, that's dreamy. Do you know what we've not <laughs> talked about? What? After the end of the day. Oh, you day. mean like late at night? Well, not necessarily late at night, but it's probably dark by this point. Okay. You've had Go a you you've had then? a lovely day's shooting. You've had your big shoot lunch or, you know, end of the shoot day meal. And we've obviously got accommodation, so nobody's going anywhere, nobody's driving. What's the one thing that you need at this point a drink a cigar <laughs> well yeah both of those things but oh, where do you ha- where do you have those drinks and cigars uh, were you about to say a hot tub i might have been. <laughs> <laughs> okay you know it's january it's cold you've just about warmed up but you you know it's getting a bit feisty a bit a bit fuggy inside <laughs> what are you going to do? I think, Hashtag sex I, well, he, <laughs> I didn't say a um, word. I, I, <laughs> I quite like a hot tub, so I'm with you on that. You could have a, if we were up on a hillside, we could have a sort of a deck running off again with another covered area with the hot tub under there, looking down across the view. <laughs> so you could be, it's a, it's a cold winter's evening. You could be sat in a hot tub there with your glass of whiskey. Looking across the valley, yeah, that's what I'm okay. talking about. <laughs> Let's stick it in. But but the other thing that you that that Tim just started to mention there, cigars, and obviously we've got to chuck on wine yeah. onto the end of that. The end the end of this balcony where you've got your uh, fly rods and all the guns. We need uh, walk in humidor, uh, obviously, uh, and <laughs> and then we need a sort of walk in. Uh, cellar temperature controlled glass upstairs for all the cases of wine and those two things this is just like the gorp gallery right so there's guns <laughs> yeah. rods cigars wine it's for a time of the evening when all the rubbish is spoken yeah exactly exactly Dream- yeah we need a very wealthy person to stock this. You know, it's all it's all very well having the frame, but if you can't fill it up, it's pointless. I think <laughs> we've already established that the budget is irrelevant. I think, as they say, if you build it, they will come. <laughs> they absolutely <laughs> will. <laughs> Everybody will want to be there. I mean, to be honest with you, you won't really need the shoot. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> no. Well, you've got some fishing already, so it sounds like a good day out without the shoot, doesn't it? Um very good. Right, okay. I mean, is there Any, anything else to add? <laughs> you've taken the words out of my mouth. I can't think of okay. it any I can't think of it anything else that you could possibly need. I've been doodling um, and sketching while we've been talking and uh, it'll be interesting oh, to see what we come up with. How exciting. <laughs> oh, amazing. <laughs> um right. Okay, so we're going to continue with the flights of fancy. Um Tim, the way we like to round off 
every episode of the podcast is to ask our guests to describe their dream shooting experience, whether it's a day or a weekend or a, an extended trip or whatever. Money's no object. Logistics don't matter. So where are you going to go? What are you going to be doing? Who are you taking with you? Where? What's the plan? Well, that's an interesting one. It's it's. Um, I've never done this, but I would love. I would. I would love to go to Scotland, doing walked up grouse shooting. I think it is. To me, that would be to come back to our beautiful shoot lodge at the end of the day, totally exhausted. The weather doesn't matter what the weather is. A good set of guns. You're walking across the moors. The exercise to be out in the, in the British countryside, in a, in a countryside that you, there is nowhere else in the world really like that. And, you know, as my final day shooting to come back, and it could be just with a brace, just a brace, you know, after walking all day, I've shot a brace. Uh, if they were good shots, seeing the dogs working to get back totally exhausted, but feeling fully fulfilled of the experience and then to be able to settle down to a lovely meal in front of that big fire but i think scotland walked up grouse would be my day who would i take i would take a selection of friends from the syndicates i'm on close friends to spend that last day of our shooting career out together and to be walking across those moors to come back you know, fully, you know, the exercise makes you feel good and uh, just a, 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 ideally a few more than a, a brace. But, uh, you know, if we could just shoot a decent bag of grouse on that final day and say, that is my shooting career. There we are. And uh, fully fulfilled. And that would be the day. That Sounds awesome. Absolutely lovely. So I don't know where that would be because I've never been doing, I've never done walked up crash shooting in Scotland, but I'm sure there are plenty of places out there that could answer that dream for me. It's wherever you can get planning, planning permission. Absolutely. To put the yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, interestingly, you're not the first person to say that walked up grouse shooting would be their, uh, their, their, their desert island shooting. Because Chris, if you remember, Sarah Farnsworth suggested that that would be hers and mm. I'm pretty sure, although I need to check with her, but I'm pretty sure that that has actually become a thing. Like she got an invitation Ooh. to go and do it. So yeah, it's been a lot of COVID since that invitation. So we'll we'll find out. I, I mean, if it, if it has happened, that would be impressive. But I'm sure it will. So if you're um, listening and you can offer Tim some walked up grouse shooting, yeah, he'll time. bring a shoot lodge. I'll bring a shoot lodge. Yeah. I'll have a shoot lodge. <laughs> <laughs> there we anyway go. Uh, very, send us an email pod at guns on indeed tim so good to have you with us and i can't wait to to see some of your drawings and ideas behind this okay so just just before we go though give me a rough stab in the dark build cost assume you've got the land and the planning and this actually was a bit of a reality give me a rough stab in the dark of a build cost of okay. what we just well, what described. we've been described let's just run through this We've described the big, large meeting area downstairs, flag floor, open fireplace for the, the guns, the beaters, the pickers up, the, everybody to get together before the shoot. We're going to arrive under a covered area to park our car, <laughs> out, our, our, our defender outside, our Range Rover outside our own door into our own part of the, the lodge hotel. We're going to walk in. There's going to be a covered area where the gun bus will pick us up to take us. So no matter what the weather, it's a covered area. Um, we are going to, at Levens, is be out on the site. We're going to have an open um, oak frame building looking across a beautiful lake for Levens is with a fire pit. So that's going to be open. It's going to be out. It's going to be separate from the main lodge. At the end of the day, we will return. We'll rise up the stairs to a large, open, vaulted oak framed room with a great big glazed gable looking down across a lake um, as we walk out we will have a deck walking out we might step down to an area where we could pick the rod up and cast a few flies um, we will stroll back up we've had our pre pre dinner drinks we're then going to we've been sitting around a large circular fireplace um, gin and tonic in hand we then move across for the main meal 
And uh, the meal will be a number of courses we're going to move. We're going to work at a sequence of moving around. So we get to speak to every guest. We'll have a, another fireplace at the end just for, um, for good measure on the gable. We will look up above of some beautiful crock framed oak trusses, oak rafters, the purlins above. So again, that cathedral of the countryside. We've, you know, working our way through the meal, we'll be brought um, a cigar from the human from from the from the humidor. We'll be brought out some lovely wine from the wine cellar, and the entertainment will go. The chat will be going. The the spirits will be rising, and then we'll decide we need to chill out a little bit, and we we'll cr crash across a deck, another deck to a covered area with a huge jacuzzi, where we can again look down across that valley with the stars twinkling, the moon shining just to set the evening <laughs> off completely. So this this is the plan we have to come up with. We need to find that valley to put this uh, this dream shoot lodge. So that is what we're going to be working on designing. Wow. Absolutely. Honestly, <laughs> round of applause. Well summarised. I mean, I, we, we need well you in our team meetings to summarise what... <laughs> I did forget the gun display. I did forget the gun display. Uh, well, there we go. Oh, okay. Yeah. Did yeah. We'll let you off. <laughs> Very good. Well, look, Tim, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, you joining us. And um, yeah, just thank you so much for coming thank on. Thank you very much. Yeah, been... I'm not going to lie. This, I think I think this has been my favourite episode yet. It's been I've fun. Had, it's, it's been, been fun. fantastic. <laughs> just Tim. dreaming. It's what shooting's yeah. about, isn't it? Just We just sit in the, we sit in the pub and we dream. And there we Lovely. go. <laughs> That's shooting. Tim, it's been so nice having you on. It has been a pleasure. Thank you. Right. So... Before we go, as per usual, there is a final reminder that you can get your hands on a pair of the very exclusive Guns on Pegs podcast shooting sock garters by sending us your shooting dilemmas for us to resolve or by getting in touch to let us know where you've been listening or by sending us your unpopular opinions. Just send us an email to pod at gunsonpegs.com and if we read it out in the next episode, we'll send you some garters. We'll be back in a couple of weeks with the final episode of Series 3. Yeah, I know. Isn't it gone quickly? Uh, but until then, thanks very much for listening and goodbye. That, that was fun. That was fun, wasn't it? I meant to say where we started. I mean, I started thinking, you know, two or three hundred thousand pounds. I think I ended up thinking probably about, you know, two million. But there we go. <laughs>